State Fire Marshal Chief Brian McGraw. Am I hot? Yeah, I'm hot. There you go. I'm live. So, thank you, Chief Riley, for cutting your remarks short. That means I've got an extra 20 minutes for my presentation. Uh, some good news and some bad news. The good news is I've got about 300 slides of charts, data, everything else. Uh, bad news, April Fool's. Oh. Uh, so, what I want to do today, first off, let's start with a disclaimer. The data you're about to see is real. The name's been changed for Peggy Okay. As Chief Chambers talked about, you know, data is important. If you look at the law enforcement community, you know, if you watch any of the police shows on TV and they've got comp stat where they're going in looking at their data and everything else, some fire agencies are to that level. A lot of them aren't. So my goal this morning is not to fill your head with a lot of statistics. There is no test at the end of this. But to have a discussion about where we have shortcomings in data collection. And hopefully at the end of it, and then at the end of the day when we have a round table, perhaps we can have some discussions on some realistic ways to try and address those shortcomings so that we've got better tools to do our jobs. So I do have real data pulled from the Enver's data warehouse. For the most part, I have tried to strike out names, take out part names, what have you, because this is not about you did something wrong. Every agency in this room does things differently. There isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer. And if we approach this from the standpoint of, oh, he's, he's calling me out, then we're not learning, we're not engaging. So th this is a judgment-free zone. We're, we're looking at holes, we're looking at gaps, and then collectively going forward, how do we address this? So community risk reduction, what is it? Different groups have different definitions, Vision 2020, uh, a process to identify and prioritize local risks followed by the integrated and strategic investment of resources, emergency response and prevention, to reduce the recurrence and impact. Los Angeles uh, Fire Department, similar identification, prioritization of risks, threats, and hazards, followed by the implementation and evaluation of strategies to lessen their impact. So the common thread in all of those, you have to identify your risk, develop solutions, implement those solutions. We get kind of into a circular logic where Hey, do we have a problem? Well, how do we know if we have a problem? We, we, we look at data. We, we talk to people. We, we look at trends. Once we establish what the problems are, we then develop strategies to address those problems. Reduce the number of fire fatalities. Reduce the number of fire injuries. Reduce the number of fires altogether. We sit around the room, we put our thinking caps on and say, okay, how do we make this happen? We come up with our best solutions. We hopefully get funding and personnel and everything else to implement them. We put, put them into practice and then we monitor the data to see, is our program actually having the desired impact? If it's working, we keep going. If it's not working, we step back, we analyze, we adjust. You know, hopefully we get to a point where, you know what, we've eliminated all the civilian fire fatalities. Great. What's the next problem we're going to attack? So we just keep going through this process. Show of hands in the room, how many agencies have a full-time, dedicated person for community education? Okay. More than I actually expected to see. Because when we get budget cuts, typically what's the first thing to go? Um, so one of the steps there with risk assessment, we, we've got to identify what the problem is. So 
So we have to look at instant data. How many fires are we going to? How many EMS runs are we going to? You know, what are the types, frequencies, locations? Do we have a specific area in our jurisdiction where all the fires are occurring? If we can identify that pattern, next question is ask, why? What is it about that area that makes it the prime spot for the fires? My former counterpart in Tennessee, Gary West, who retired uh, about a year ago, now works for the National Fire Sprinkler Association, has probably one of the best data analysis units in the country when you look at state fire marshal's offices. They can actually pull up on their system. They can take you down to a specific house on a street, and based on census data, fire loss data, socioeconomic data, they can tell you the relative risk of that house to have a fire compared to the house next door, the house next down the block, and the house on the other side of town. I wish we could do that here in Virginia. Someday, wish will thank me. Um, but as part of this risk assessment, you know, what are the things that we need to protect? And, and community risk reduction, it's not just fire. You know, EMS calls. My former agency, Arlington County, you know, we saw a very high number of EMS calls, and we were in an all ALS system, and we were tying up ALS resources to transport people to hospitals for non-ALS situations. So in order to try and cut back on that utilization issue, we started an advanced practice paramedic program. A diversion program where, hey, medic unit got on scene, you know, this isn't a life-threatening, doesn't require ALS, you know, it's the, this is the flu or the stub toe or what have you. One of the EMS supervisors who was certified as an advanced practice paramedic would come out, they'd do an assessment, and then they could get the person a taxi voucher, send them down to the local doc in the box, send them to the 24-hour clinic, or even send them to, you know, a taxi or other means of transportation to the local ER but not tying up that ALS resource from the fire department. So it's fire, it's EMS, it's other issues, property maintenance. You know, it all ties together. We say we're all hazards, and in order to truly be all hazards, we also need to expand outside the fire department. We need to pull in our zoning folks. We need to pull in our property maintenance folks. We need to pull in our law enforcement folks. And we all need to be looking at the problems together and come up with solutions from a team, from a team perspective. Critical infrastructure is something that we're starting to do very heavily at the state level. We're just kind of in the infancy stage. We've got a state critical infrastructure working group. At the federal level, the Department of Homeland Security has target hazards, level one, level two, that they've identified. They're basically, in order to qualify as a level one, you have to have if you have an event in that facility, you're going to have a certain number of fatalities. It's going to be over a certain dollar loss, or it's going to have a significant impact to the economy or the people. It's a fairly high threshold to be a Federal Department of Homeland Security level one. Level two is much better. We've got some here in the state. Can't tell you what they are. Um, but once you get beyond that that federal level, you know we see here, here at the state level and what. Uh, Alexandria says is that is critical infrastructure in their community is maybe different than what Norfolk says is critical infrastructure in their community. So at the state level, we're trying to create some definitions, some thresholds to help steer people towards identifying what's critical infrastructure, the business community, transportation community, emergency services, what have you, to help prioritize resources to go do risk assessments to these facilities, develop plans to safeguard them, to plan for in the event of a natural disaster or other incident to be able to get them back online with the least impact. You know, this, this session was scheduled for last September and we canceled it because of a severe weather event. How many folks in the room were impacted by that event? How long did it take you to get back to normal? So those are some of the things we're looking at, identification of target hazards. Again, coming from Arlington County, we, we had a big five-sided <coughs> target hazard in our first two, called the Pentagon. 
Other folks, you have different things in your jurisdiction. They're the target hazards. Are you devoting additional resources to them for planning, for preparation? So the big thing up at the top there is incident data. Because as with anything else, we go before the General Assembly, hey, we, we need to change the law. Well, why? Prove it. Show us the statistics. Show us the data that supports why there's a need. Why are we going to spend money or resources on a problem if you can't prove that it's a problem? And then once we do dedicate the money and the resources, that we can't prove that it's having a positive impact. And unfortunately, the Virginia General Assembly, right, while we're indifferent, we can go to them with national data. They're like, well, that's great. That's the rest of the country. We're Virginia. Show me the problem in Virginia. And I'm here to tell you that's kind of challenging. Chief Chambers mentioned the five E's of community risk reduction. You know, so once we've identified our problems, here's the methods that we can, that are generally accepted as the way that we fix those problems. Emergency response, what happens on a daily basis? Some of these issues, fire prevention, uh, you know, getting into homes and helping people with their meds and other things, hopefully cut down on the emergency response component. We're hopefully addressing it through the engineering, the education. A lot of the publications that you look at when they have this list, enforcement and education are actually swapped. They have enforcement before education. I'm a very firm believer in education first. I can't hold somebody accountable if they don't know what the requirement is. So we need to get out there and teach them, hey, this is what you need to be doing. And then if they don't follow suit, then we can bring the enforcement component into it. And last but not least, economic incentive. You know, at the federal level, there were tax breaks brought in for retrofitting sprinkler systems into existing buildings. When residential sprinklers first came out, they, you know, there's jurisdictions around the country that provide an economic incentive, tax reduction, insurance reduction, what have you, for putting sprinklers in. Virginia, we, we can't even get the requirement for sprinklers, so we, we've got to get there. You know, perhaps getting an economic incentive will get some of the folks on board to require one sprinklers. But the key to this is follow the data. And if we don't have the data, we've got some issues. So, you know, question number one, in your agency, how are you documenting your incidents? And because we're talking primarily fire fatalities, how are you documenting your investigations? Are you using ENFERS? EFERS, the Virginia version of it. Uh, once the Suppression company has cleared the scene, and you finish your fire investigation. Are you going back and updating the fire incident report to show the results of your investigation? What was the cause of the fire? Where was it? Where did it start? If you had a fatality after the fact, you pulled somebody out, they were severely burned, they get taken to the uh, the burn center. A week, ten days, a month later, they succumb to their injuries. Are you going back and updating that fire incident report to reflect that fatality? <clears throat> Are you using your incident report data? Because, you know, one of the things, the folks in the field, if they're not understanding the use or the application or the benefit of good data, what incentive do they have to generate good data? Garbage in, garbage out. Show of hands, in your agency, when somebody gets promoted to lieutenant or captain, as part of their transitional training from riding backwards to riding forwards, how many of your agencies actually have structured training on how to do fire incident reporting? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? So, you know, that's a problem. Who in your agency is actually doing the reporting? Is it the company officer? Is it the incident commander? For a working fire, is it the fire, the lead fire investigator after the fact? 
When you get back from a run at 3 o'clock in the morning, is it the low man on the totem pole? Hey, bro, I got the report for me, would you? I'm going back to bed. So if we, as agencies, are not training our people, number one, of the value of the data, and then number two, how to create and enter good data, why do we expect on the downstream end, why do we expect that we're going to have good usable data? So, batch is a system that's out there, it's from the ATF, it's free, for, it, it's free software that's used primarily, it's the bomb parson tracking system. If you're a FBI bomb squad, you're required to use it for your bomb squad activity reporting. I know there are a number of agencies around the state that use it for their fire incident reporting. It's a very robust and useful intelligence crime data analysis tool where you can go in if you have an incident and you see a certain, let's say you have an arson, what you believe to be an arson fire, you have an incendiary device, you can actually query in the bat system characteristics of the incendiary device and it will search the database with whatever parameter you state statewide, nationwide, what have you, and come up with other incidents that have similar characteristics. And then if you look, hmm, do I have a pattern? Maybe this is the same person. So there's a lot of good things out there. But in order for the data to be good, in order to get use out of it, we have to use the systems. And we have to use them correctly. We have to have good information. So just a little bit about ENFERS, the National Fire Incident Reporting System. Started by the U.S. Fire Administration years and years and years ago. This is the latest information off of their website. About 20, a little over 24,000 fire departments. Um, 30 of those fire departments serve in populations over 500,000, so the big boys. Uh, in a New York City, Los Angeles County. <coughs> Approximately just shy of 28 million incidents are entered into ENFERS annually. About 1.2 million actual fires. And it captures about 75% of the actual fires that occur, occur across the country on an annual basis. So, you know, again, are you participating? In Virginia, we have BFERS, the Virginia Fire Incident Reporting System. It's just the way we refer to it, it takes, you know, based off the ENFERS model. Uh, I would like to be able to tell you that we have 95, 98, or 99 percent participation rate in the Commonwealth. We don't. It's a voluntary system. I took my slide out that actually had what our participation rate is because what we're seeing is, you know, I've been compiling the data both for this presentation but also updating the Fire Service Supports Fire Prevention Control Plan. Our participation has decreased over the last two years. And we're trying to go back and find the root cause. Is it because agencies have actually stopped inputting data? Is it an upload lag? You know, when the federal government shut down at the end of last year, that also shut down the U.S. Fire Administration, their data uh, group. So are we playing catch up? Um, is it an issue where in some jurisdictions in the Commonwealth where, hey, I have a county that, cur that used to have 10 independent volunteer fire departments, we've now consolidated into a single county department, so we've gone from 10 FDIDs to one FDID at the county level. So we're working through that process of why are we seeing the reduction, and when, you know, after identifying those that are no longer participating, to reach out to them and say, hey, what gives? Why aren't you participating? You know, Fire Programs has a grant program where you can get computers, software, what have you, to be able to participate. But Virginia's reporting system is voluntary. There's nothing tied to your reporting. If you look at the map, the states in red have mandatory reporting for all fire incidents. Pennsylvania, if you don't submit your fire incident reporting, guess what? You don't get your ATL money. Blue states have some level of required reporting. Maybe, it's, maybe you're required to report fatalities, maybe you're required to report fireworks injuries, maybe you're required to report burn injuries. 
It's not 100% you have to report every single fire incident, but there is some statutory requirement. The rest of the country, the green states, it's voluntary at varying levels. So some of the things that you can do with fire incident reporting, you know, at the national level, it can help develop educational programs. Chief Chambers was talking about a consistent message. You know, the National Fire Protection Association every year comes out with their theme for Fire Prevention Week. Uh, a lot of fire departments pick up on that, but there's still departments out there that do their own thing. You've got other agencies that come out with messages, what have you. But by looking at data, hey, what's the number one problem in the United States for fires? And what's the national message we should be putting out there? And drill it down to the state level. What's the number one problem at the state level? <clears throat> Recommendations for national codes and standards. We're seeing problems because of construction. We're seeing problems because of fire spread. We're seeing problems because of bad habits. Without data to support it, how do you see patterns? How do you see trends? You know, the Mr. Coffee recall of years ago, you know, I've got a fire over on the west coast with Mr. Coffee Maker, I've got one on the east coast with Mr. Coffee Maker. <coughs> Do we have a trend? Yeah, two fires doesn't really make a trend, but when you start to have more and more numbers, if you're not able to capture and see that trend as that being caused, how do you identify that the a particular product is the, is the problem? So research efforts, National Institute of Standards and Technology, UL Labs, what have you, they look at this fire data, hey, where are we hurting people, where are we killing people, where are we hurting firefighters, where are we killing firefighters, what can we do to make those situations better and lower those numbers? And support for federal legislation. I already mentioned, you know, Virginia, we go in, hey, give us, the, give us the data to back it up. Local benefits, tracking your resources. When we go to the CompStat analogy, you know, where are my high incidence of fires? Where are my high incidence of EMS? Do I have a major online uh, sales company that's going to be moving into my jurisdiction? And can I predict, hey, I'm going to need to add an engine company, I'm going to need to add a, a, a medic unit down there to pick up the additional, the additional needs? Justify your budget. You know, we've seen a decrease in Overcrowded complaints in our nightclubs on Friday and Saturday nights because we've actively put fire marshals out there for active enforcement. Yeah, we're paying them overtime to be out, but we've seen a positive benefit from it. Can you prove that now? Helps you focus on community problems, predict future problems, and measure program performance. Anchors has 11 modules. The ones on the left side are the standard, basically mandatory modules. The ones on the right side are optional modules. As we've been diving through the data, some of it, some folks are using the optional modules, others aren't. And when we compare, we're going to see a slide here in a little bit. When we look at some of the statistics, say, compared from the fire module compared to the basic module or the fire module to the structured fire module, there's actually differences in the data that we get out of it. So, lots of small print. But on, this is the last five years worth of data. The 2018 numbers are as of Friday. But if you look at those numbers are incident responses. 2017 total responses just shy of 800,000. For 2018, about 530,000. Again, have we actually, have our incidents gone down? Has our reporting gone down? Is the reporting catching up? That's what we're working on. And, you know, the, the difference in the numbers from February when I pulled the fire services board meeting till Friday when I pulled them to update this presentation, probably about a 30,000 jump in incidents. Same thing when you look at the, the dollar values, uh, fire service deaths, civilian deaths, what have you. We're going to focus today on the civilian death number. So this is just some of the information that you can get out of Emperor's beepers. If you go to the U.S. Fire Administration website, there is a free uh, interface that you can download, subscribe for user access. I have the benefit.
benefit is the state fire marshal of being having access to uh, the U.S. Fire Administration's pilot data warehouse program. So I've got what I consider to be a bit more user-friendly interface that allows me to go in and set prompts and what have you for the for the data. It also allows me to go back to a larger set of data. I actually have the ability to do queries on a national level. I can take another state and look at their data. Eventually, that'll hopefully be out there, but you know, if you just look at incidents, and this is 2018 data, so residential fires, 4,239 total residential, the majority of those, 2,853 in dwellings, one and two family homes. That's intuitively obvious, isn't it? How many of you would agree, yep, our, our largest instance of fires are in one and two family homes. So, you know, there's stuff that we can look at based on our experience and what have you and say, yes, we know this, but we've got numbers to back it up. From this one, 67% of the residential fires are in that category. This is just a different presentation of it, it's a bar chart. And, you know, one and two family dwellings for the residential is the largest by far. You go to your General Assembly, your, your county board, what have you, you can put them into picture format instead of having them digest the numbers. That, that's a pretty compelling picture right there that's showing the difference between one and two family dwellings and everything else. For public property use, you know, assembly occupancies, mercantile business, about the same. Again, to what Chief Riley was talking about earlier, the second bar down, we do still have fires in educational properties. They haven't gone away, so it is a hazard that we are concerned about. When we look at these supplemental locking devices, the security measures, and we get the law enforcement officers and school officials that are worried about just the one dimensional, let's fix the fix the security issue. Okay, great, we can fix the security issue, but we need to take everything else into account into account at the same time. And yeah, this one just everything else. But through the Edfers interface. These are some of the products that you can pull out. You can do it just for your jurisdiction. You can do it at the state level. You can do it at the national level. See trends. How do we compare? Year over year. Structure fire causes. Big one down here at the bottom. And, uh, unknown. 18% of our structure fires. The causes classified as unknown. And the question becomes, why is that? Are we not having investigations done? When we are doing investigations, are we exhausting the investigations? And, yep, we, we can't pin it down. Uh, I'm here to tell you that there are a large number of fires in the Commonwealth of Virginia that are not actually investigated. Because if you don't have a local fire official or a local fire marshal, who is responsible by statute for ensuring an investigation is completed? State police becomes the default investigatory agency. My staff get phone calls on a regular basis. Hey, we have fire and such and such. Can you guys come out and, and, and investigate it for us? No, that's not in our scope at this time. You need to contact the state police. Well, we already did. They said they're not coming because there wasn't a fatality, there wasn't a large dollar loss, and there's nothing causing that fire chief's spidey sense to kick in and say, yep, it's suspicious. So I can't quantify how many fires we don't have, aren't getting investigated. Because again, we have that issue of, are they getting reported into beepers? Are we then not getting results? My counterpart to the South in North Carolina, another Brian, Brian Taylor, the North Carolina State Fire Marshal in North Carolina up until last year, the State Bureau of Investigation had primary jurisdiction for fire investigations. About two years ago, North Carolina imposed an administrative requirement, mandatory reporting of fatal fires. Once they started getting that mandatory reporting, they found that their 
I heard that problem was far worse than what they thought. And that gave them the data to be able to go to the legislature and get the statute cha changed so that now the North Carolina State Fire Marshal's Office has investigatory authority. They're working for an upcoming legislative session to make them the primary and take the State Bureau of Investigation out. The SB doesn't have adequate resources to investigate all the fires. My shop doesn't have adequate resources to investigate all the fires. But there's a there's a disconnect there, and the question is how do we how do we solve that problem? How do we fix that problem? So this is residential structure fires, and you know, smoking three three percent, cooking's probably the highest at 16% followed closely by unknown, or actually unknown it beats cooking, but, you know, so cooking fires, unattended smoking, or improperly discarded smoking materials, electrical, heating tend to be the big four. The handout that you got about the fire program, if you flip over to the back side of that, there is a summary of last year's data. And we're going to talk about it in a little bit more detail, but 60 civilian fire fatalities in the Commonwealth of Virginia. When that was put together and putting this together, we found a couple more. Um, but based on that, you know, the mean age of the victims, 68 and change. And again, the big causes, cooking, improperly discarded smoking materials, heating appliances. Enford Beefers allows you to go in and pull this data. If, but again, if we're not getting accurate input, if we're not getting updates, what good is this chart to the city to be able to identify a problem? Based on that, yeah, we can say we need to teach the bottom book. But is that really where the problem is? So if you look at the injuries and deaths, and interesting, two civilian deaths, from intentional causes, 272 intentional, intentionally set fires. I wonder how many prosecutions there were for those 272 intentionally set fires. Um, when we work down 19, our largest number of civilian deaths caused the fire unknown. Again, how can we sit here and say, we have a fire problem, this is what we need to focus on if we don't know what's causing the fire. And this is for the fires that are reported. So it looks good, right? You can print out the pretty charts, graphs, numbers out the wazoo. We can baffle them with data. But is the data any good? I've already touched on some of the shortcomings. This is a comparison, again, from the Enfers. The center two columns are numbers pulled from the, the basic module. The number on the right is from the fire module. So when you go in, you're clicking your fire report, if you're doing your fire report, if you click that there was a structure fire with damage, it should open up the fire module when you want to require you to put in a whole bunch more information. First guy to McKnight in dollar loss, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at the difference here in the basic module, heating fires, 606, fire module 166. Cooking fires, 1,612 reported in the basic module, but only 494 in the fire module. Why is that? They know not to click structure fire. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it was Howard, Howard Black Marcino I had a conversation with in Charlottesville. And you know, he got a phone call from an insurance company saying, hey, you know, we need your fire investigation report for XYZ loss. Uh, you know, right now it's about a $15,000 loss, and we need the fire report to back it up so we can pay the claim out. Howard went and pulled it up in his system. He hadn't sent a fire marshal out to investigate it. Pulled it up in the system, and it was coded in the system. Fire contained pot, no extension. $15,000 worth of no extension. How about you? And what does that come down to? You know, we. And, and again, not, it's not definitive, it's speculation, but hey, we get back to the fire scene. If, if I click that there's extension, 
Man, that's 10 more minutes I'm going to be sitting here doing that report. I know that I can game the system because if I click this box, I can close it out without doing all those other windows. So, again, how do we get good data? Unknown fires down here, 1,100 in the basic module, 600 in the fire module. There's a disconnect. Bar, the bars you see in front of you, when I first came into the state, well, every week I produce a weekly report that includes tracking of fire deaths. It goes up to my boss, goes up to the secretary's office, goes up to the governor's office. When I first came in the door, you know, the number that we were reporting was based on the U.S. Fire Administration's home fatalities in the news. Home in the news. I followed that for a while. I tasked my staff around the state, hey, here's the pavement. If you hear in the news in the morning, if you see in the local newspaper, if you hear from the local fire department that you had a fatality, let me know so that we can get a better sense of how the data compares. You can see yellow is the USFA reporting and green is it Enbridge reporting. So for 2018, the US Fire Administration website says we had 52 home fire fatalities in the news. Enbridge reports 39 civilian fire deaths and fire accidents. Disconnect. So if we look at 2018 numbers, again, U.S. Fire Administration, 52. In my office, we had 60, based on getting reports from some of you folks in the room, media searches, what have you. Um, as I said, we found three more as I was digging deep into the ENFERS data here. The ENFERS numbers, well, how many do we have? It depends on which report you run. So if you run the incidents with a reported death, 67 reported deaths, 23 of those are in structure fire incidents. One of those is a duplicate report, but two fire departments reported the same death. And we'll have an example of that later. If you run the casualties report, there were 74 fatalities in 70 incidents, 39 fire fatalities in 37 incidents, 35 non-fire fatalities. So when you run this casualties report or the incidents with reported death, you know, it shows you was a building fire, was a one or two family dwelling, was an EMS incident, was a motor vehicle accident. Um, so when you parse through it, but you know, there, there's discrepancy in the data. We've tracked 60, now potentially 63. You know, USFA data and Enfers data, a little bit more than half of that. So, again, this is just a graphic representation of those fire incidents. The, the largest one being rescue and EMS incidents, surprise. Uh, the second bar from the top is the deaths from structure fires for civilians. So it gives you a, a pretty way to present the data, a quick glance at it to show where it's occurring. Double service calls, mobile property and vehicle, fire, other. And again, as I said, when I came in, we were looking at the residential civilian structure fires, we've now expanded our numbers so that we are looking at all civilian fire deaths. And you know, that can lead to a conversation of the chicken versus the egg. If I had a motor vehicle accident, somebody crashes their car into a tree, car catches fire, they die, is it a fire death or is it a motor vehicle accident? Wait for the autopsy report. Again, other outside special property is the largest there, residential second, that other outside, most of the motor vehicle accidents. Because again, this is all fire deaths, not just fire deaths. So where is the disconnect? Why do we have this disconnect? <coughs> One of them may be the investigators don't have access to beepers. State police don't have access to the system. There was discussion a year and a half, a little over two years ago when I was first coming in the door, before I got here, there were some discussions with state police about providing them access to beepers so that they could go in and enter investigatory data. But two problems with it. Number one, the state police said, yeah, we don't want to have another system that we have to deal with. But number two, how do we make that happen? 
data entry standpoint because if they are investigating a fire that's run by the Broadnax Fire Department down in Brunswick County, that's under Brunswick. It's not under the state police. So how do they get into that particular fire that's in Dublin today? State police, the folks over the, the arson bond unit are in transition right now. Uh, Fern Hall retired at the end of the year. We're still waiting for his official replacement to be named. But I had had a meeting with Vern Hall a while back. Uh, we're going to talk about the fire fatality form that we created and have pushed out. And Vern basically told me, hey, you know, once you figure out what data elements you want, push that over to us. Our fire summary report is due for an update. We can make sure we capture all those in that report. And we just make it SOP if we, if we have a fatal incident. We, we transmit a copy of that summary sheet to your office. Like, great. Now we just need to make it happen. Um, investigator doesn't update the fire report with fatality information. Year before last, I want to say it was, Henrico County had a fire incident late at night cooking on the stove. It was a couple of weeks later, a total of four fatalities, <coughs> but they succumbed to their injuries after the fact. Did Henrico go back and update that fire incident? For black four deaths. So, uh, I work for Enrico. Yep. We submit the fire reports to my office. Uh, part of the issue is that the state told us that we can't necessarily update it. Uh, we have to submit an entire file over. Um, so, I feel like if there was a much easier way to do that and just update the ones, you know, that they update, because they wait for a lab report or anything to come back, it does take a while. Um, but right now we're not doing that because it's not feasible. We right, and, and, and that's one of the things that we hopefully going forward can figure out from a data communication standpoint, from a process standpoint, how do we make that work and get that information. Um, <coughs> you know, again, it, in Arlington, we, we run a structure fire. You know, if you go back to the scene, I'd be out, still be out there digging away. Battalion chief was in command and we go in and do, do the report. We use Timberland's uh, system. He put incident, he clicked under investigation, and then once he clicked the box to lock it, whether it was an hour later, three hours later, three days later, I couldn't go in and change it. I had to get had to go get a super user to unlock it so that we could then update the data. So yeah, it's it's a process, and because of those speed bumps, it creates a deterrent to actually getting the information in there. So how do we fix that? You talked about state police using the beepers. I enter my reports on my sheriff's office IVR system. So do we have the possibility, because you know the arson code and a couple other codes are mandatory reports to law enforcement, do we search their systems? Or do we have access to search for some of these missing pieces? If it's a law enforcement only community, that might not have a look yeah, and, and that's the problem. And you, you get into the different systems that are out there. Um, the definition of a law enforcement officer, well, you're not Title IX, so I'm not giving you any access to my system. There's just a whole host of disconnects. And we need to figure out, again, how to fix that. So, again, miscoded incidents, you know, we referred to that earlier with the, the kitchen fire fire with no extension versus an actual structure fire. You know, wrong incident type, um, you know, mutual or automatic aid to another locality. Over here, I left my folder sitting on the desk. When I came in a year ago, well, two and a half years ago, uh, week number two, we started a fire investigator class in the Division One offices. And with that, our IT folks who were doing beefers came over and handed me a stack that was thicker than this one. But of all the fire incidents that were labeled as undetermined or under investigation in the Commonwealth, of course, the first thing I did was hold up, look for 0 1 300, go right into the line. But, you know, and when I looked at that list, not more mine, but I did see some. Arlington incidents that listed under investigation, but they run automatic aid in Fairfax County. 
So Arlington was never going to get the investigatory result because it was a Fairfax County incident, or vice versa. So those things create some issues. So if I look at, again, the USFA 52 fatalities, the State Fire Marshal's 60 fatalities is the one that put this together, the list on the left are all incidents that occurred in Virginia, which the USFA doesn't report on their site. And again, USFA reports based on in the news. If you go to and you pull up Virginia, there's an option to collect to select output in an Excel file. One of the columns in the Excel file is actually a hyperlink to the news story that they're basing it on. I sent them links for a number of these incidents. I said, great, we'll, we'll get it updated. This is me holding my breath. Still, it's still not updated. Um, February 23rd, fatality in Victoria. Again, I was at Mount Bar one day, just sitting there having a conversation with Howard Lock Marcino, who works part-time as an investigator for an insurance company, and happened to mention that he was working a fatal fire down in Victoria that you know, state police had investigated, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Got the information. We had no record of it at that point. USFA had no record of it. We did do some searching. We did find a media report on it. Because it was a beloved high school teacher or principal that passed away in the fire. So it got attention locally. Um, U.S. Fire Administration double counts a couple of incidents. They list a March 15th incident in Chester. That I reached out to Keith and said, hey, Keith, what do you have? Not mine. Is it Chester, Pennsylvania, maybe? Um, and then there was an incident in Petersburg where we, we still haven't closed the loop on it of whether it was preceding causes to the fire. So I went back to 2017, just in case, you know, 2018, we're still getting data in. Here are four incidents, and again, if you look at this chart, in the full spreadsheet on the left hand side, you would actually see the fire department name, their FDID, what have you. But here's four incidents, the top two that are bracketed. Both occurred on the 11th of May. Top one classifies as a building fire, automatically received one or two family dwelling. We had a fatality for which they had a name entered, the X's, we've X'd out the names. Male 48, the one below it, male 49, same date, but I think likelihood is that that's the same incident. Those two fire at are 12 miles apart. They say automatic aid received. I'm going to bet department number two is the department that gave the automatic aid. So if I'm responding into somebody else's jurisdiction, once I click that automatic aid given box, I don't need to report fatality. I don't need to report investigation because it's on the jurisdiction I gave the aid to. The bottom two happened to be from the same fire department. Different fire department than the first two, but the, the, the bottom two incidents are from one fire department. And as you can see, both of them had a death. We had a name for both of them. We had an age and, and a gender. One of them, we had occupancy type. Um, but for the other one, we don't. So this just, again, another illustration of the disconnect based on who's entering it, how are they coding it, what module are they using. So I mentioned the list that I was handed. This is the current list of 2018 of unresolved fire incidents. Things that in the system are either undetermined or under investigation. And an average of 3,000 a year. For 2018, it's only 2,000, but again, they lag, what have you. Now, to me, some of this is suspect because if you look at this report, and if I pick the word, second, third, fourth, one right here in the middle, you know, it appears that all the blocks are filled in. Outside equipment fire, one or two family dwelling, courtyard patio, backfire from internal combustion engine, uh, flammable liquid gas, uncontained and unintentional. You know, so that looks like it has all the boxes checked, but for some reason the Enver system is saying, 
Yeah, that's still an unresolved incident. You look at some of the other ones up here, and uh, you know, and under very top one, first item ignited, undetermined. Third one down, undetermined. So pretty much anywhere you've got an undetermined or under investigation, it pops into this report. The other thing we look at, how do we quantify our fire loss problem? How much damage, you know, let, let's take fatality and injury issue out of it. How much damage are we doing in terms of dollars and cents? Because that's where a lot of people live. How much, how much is this costing us? And there are some fire departments that talk about, hey, you know, when we were, you know, we have a fire, rather than reporting the lost value, let, let's report the saved value. So it's a five hundred thousand dollar house. It was a hundred thousand dollars worth of damage. So we, as the fire department, saved four hundred thousand dollars worth of property. Is that a good selling point for your local legislators to, to justify your existence and showing you're doing a good job? Yeah. But if you look at these. Over 10,000 incidents a year where the fire file, and these are for structure fires, there is no fire loss associated with it. So if somebody clicked the box to say, yep, there was an actual fire, they clicked the other information, but then when they get down to the end, they put, didn't put in an estimated loss. And again, I'll be the first one to admit, we don't have consistent or standard means for determining dollar loss value. When I was an investigator, I would typically go to the county website, pull up the tax assessment, what, what's the property, what, what's the home improvements valued at, what an approximate percentage of, of what was damaged, throw in a number for contents, and there was my number. Uh, you know, you can go to RS means is a big is a well-known one for construction costs and figure out you know how much you know what's the value, but are you then actually figuring out the loss value or are you figuring out the replacement value? Of course the easiest thing is at the end of the day, to have a relationship with your insurance companies. Hey, once you guys settle this out, let us know what the dollar value was so we can we, we can update our system to show what the actual arbitrary value is. So another component that we look at, you know, smoke alarms. Chief Chambers was talking about the percentage of places that have smoke alarms versus the percentage that don't. Based on 2018 data, this is just one data set that you can pull out, but a detector was present in the yellow 55% of the time. Confirmed no detector present 19% of the time. And then in the green, 26% of the time, we don't know. So, present or functional? Well, it, that's a separate category. This is just whether or not it's present. There is a separate data input for whether it's operating or not. You know, so the question here is, again, it goes back to who's entering the data. Is your line engine company officer really concerned whether there was a smoke alarm there or not but that's something that for the investigators in the room you can add to your list of hey make a conscious determination were, were there smoke alarms were the smoke alarms functioning there are ways to, to determine that again you know our neighbors in the north of Maryland they ask as of January 1st of 2018, you're installing new smoke alarms in a, in a residence. They have to be 10 years sealed lithium ion battery smoke alarms. So they've been able to show value, need, get that legislated. New York State just had a similar law kick in. Wouldn't it be great here in Virginia if we were able to pass state level legislation to the legislature or to the building code that says this is what you need to do? So these problems that I've laid out, these shortcomings, how do we fix it? And, you know, I'm open to suggestions. Some hey, Brian. Increase beefers participation. Brian, is there any discussion 
I think we agree that the fire reporting system is discombobulated, to say the least. Is there any discussion to make the fire reporting system more efficient? Because in there, if you read some of the things and you go through the categories, multiple incidents can occur and have the same meaning in different titles. For, for example, system malfunction versus an unintentional alarm. Mm -hmm. They can be both. Right. So which one do you choose and where do you go? Yeah, and, and part of that comes to we're, we're dealing with a system whose coding and what have you is probably 40 years old. Uh, I told Chief Kate I was going to throw him under the bus. Uh, NFPA was awarded a U.S. Fire Administration grant to look at the data collection system and basically, uh, you know, hopefully develop a replacement or update the system. And I'll defer to him for either the round table this afternoon or what have you to comment on that. Um, but a lot of it comes to training. You, get, you know, U.S. Fire Academy does a six-day class on Enfers. So six by eight, 48 hours. Show of hands in the room, how many of you chief officers, company officers, received more than 16 hours of formal training in doing fire incident reporting? Eight hours? Yeah, so, so we're coming up short there. We've had some discussions internally in fire programs. You know, is this something that we add into Fire Officer 1, Fire Officer 2, Fire Officer 3, Fire Officer 4, just keep pounding it in? Do we develop, you know, it, it, if, we, if we created a standalone program for training fire incident reporting, how to, how many folks in this room are going to be in line to stand, sign up for it? It, it is. Well, it depends where you capture a firefighter, too. You require them to do an inverse report. The report that's used for the test is probably 10 years old at this point. Mm -hmm. So it's not really up to date and in touch, even at that level, of that little bit of education with what we're doing. Right. You know, so for most people, data reporting isn't exciting. It's not sexy. It's not. So there's, you know, they're not chomping at the bit to go learn how to do fire incident reporting. So. We've got a challenge, how do we make it exciting? One of the things is to make them understand the value of it and, and, and what role it serves. <laughs> then we need to give it to them in bits and pieces throughout their training so that we're reinforcing it and expanding on it. Way in the back. Uh, just an interesting point that on the topic um, when you're thinking about it is if you look at reporting systems where we have an EMS reporting system and a fire reporting system, on the EMS reporting side, because that's been modernized uh, very frequently, you can make a or, or design a run form or whatever, if you will, that any idiot can fill out because they know exactly what they have to um, answer and what they shouldn't answer. And oh, I forgot this. This is outside of parameters. But with the fire reporting, uh, it's very difficult to design anything like that because of the I mean, it's basically a digitized paper form. That's it's not anything more. Right. And, you know, Enfers is the back end of the system. What you're using on the front end varies from agency to agency. Show of hands, how many in the room use Tiburon for incident reporting? Just our own, okay. How many use image training? A few more. How many use firehouse software? Those of you that haven't raised your hand, you know, what, what are some of the other ones out there that you're using? Okay. So there are different, uh, again, you, you can go to the U.S. Fire Administration website, get their plug-in module, which fortunately you don't have to punch holes in cards anymore to, to input your data, but it is a dated, not very user-friendly system. Hence, we've got a lot of third-party vendors that have their, we're the best for doing your, your incident input. Some of them are more user-friendly than others. Some are more customizable than others. You know, and then it really comes to a software and then a department level of how much customization you do. How, how easy do you make it for your personnel to, to do the data entry? And 
Some departments have invested a lot of time and resources into it. Others, not so much. So, you know, increased VFIRS participation, there, there has been discussion over the years about either through administrative regulation or statutory regulation code of Virginia mandating fire reporting. Tying it to ATL money, things along those lines. Anytime, you know, we turn around and say, You're, we're, we're going to require you to do something, there's a lot of pushback. You know, again, we go, we go to some parts of the state, we don't have internet, we don't have, you know, reliable internet, what have you, so how are we supposed to participate in this? So, improving data quality, training, policies and procedures. How many of you in your department actually have an SOP or SOP for completing incident reports? Okay. Body assurance, for those of you that have a policy, are you reviewing the reports to ensure that they comply with your policy? Even if you don't have a policy, are you going back and looking at your incident reports? I know EMS reports get a lot of scrutiny. We're dealing with insurance payments, we're dealing with drug inventory, we're dealing with things along those lines. They're getting looked at a couple times, probably. In your agencies, you know, does the ship, does the station officer review all the reports for his ship? Does the battalion chief review all the uh, sampling reports for his ship? Is there someone in administration that reviews the sampling reports? Is the chief fire marshal doing a QA, QC of any legitimate, actual <coughs> fire report? Or to take it down a set for anyone where you have a civilian injury or civilian fatality? Who's doing the quality control on that? Standardization. Yeah, Enfers is a standard, standardized reporting system with a couple thousand incident codes. Is it a street or road in a commercial area, street or road in a residential area? Is it a mobile dwelling? Is it a RV? Is it, you know, what what some of these mean? And you know, there is a reporting guide or a book that you can go to look up what the different codes are. Some of them over time have gotten explanations, a lot of them don't. So, you know, some of them are subject to interpretation. Um, standard interface. All things that could bring about improvements, but how do we get there? Again, when we turn around and say you have to do something, it's like my mom tells you you have to clean your room. I ain't doing that. You know, so it's it, it's got to be a it's got to be a collaborative process that comes from grassroots of people saying, you know, yes, we, we understand there's a need, we understand there's a problem, and we want to be part of the solution. Let's get together and, and figure out solutions that we can all get on board with and all make work. As a short-term solution for fatal fires, about a year ago, we pushed out to all the local fire officials in the room a fire fatality reporting form. I actually borrowed it from Brian One in the Maryland State Fire Marshal. If you look at the Mid-Atlantic, Maryland State Fire Marshal is Brian, I'm Brian, North Carolina is Brian, so we're one, two, and three based on our time of appointment. But Maryland has mandatory fire incident reporting, they have mandatory fire fatality reporting, they have mandatory fireworks injury reporting, they have mandatory burn injury reporting. So I borrowed their fire fire pay down report form, tweaked it to say Virginia, changed a few other things on it, but it's a, you know, it's a PDF billable form. We pushed it out to all the local fire officials and said, hey, if you have a fatal fire incident, please complete this one page form and send it to us so that we're getting more information and we're getting it sooner. We've gotten some pushback on that. Oh, you know, it's another form for our guys to use. You're going to get it anyway because we put it into beavers. Well, I hope I've proven the point to you today 
that we don't necessarily get in review for that person. So, you know, again, we pushed it out to the local fire officials, the next one to deal with the state police and the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. If you have a fatal fire that you do the autopsy, that you investigate, please fill out this form and send it to us. I would rather get three forms on the same incident, and we do that data comparison to get that that's the same incident. And between the three, we've gotten all the information, then not get any information at all. And that's probably got on a lot of fires today. We don't have information. When we pushed out this form, we also made the statement that you might get a phone call from a deputy state fire marshal. You might have a deputy state fire marshal show up on your scene or in your office saying, hey, can we get some information? Some people misinterpreted that, and I think some of my folks may have misrepresented it, that, hey, the state fire marshal has taken over all fatal fire investigations. Absolutely not. I don't have the resources to do everything I am charged with, let alone to come and take over your, your, your fatal fire scenes. But we're following suit with what my counterpart in South Carolina has done, where they basically have a statewide fire fatality incident response investigation team. Folks from the state fire marshal's go, you know, they, they learn a fatal fire that occurs somewhere in the state, folks from the state fire marshal's office go out. Their primary job on that scene is to collect data <coughs> to find out what do we know about the person that died, what caused it, were there smoke alarms, were they working, were there sprinklers, were they working. Now, as a night of benefit, hey, you've got an extra set of hands or two that if you need help, they can, you know, hey, free labor. But they're not there force their way onto your scene, they're not there to take over your investigation. They're there to try and shorten the window in which we get as much information as we possibly can. Some of the localities that are in the room have been very good about proactively sending us the fire fatality reports. Um, some of the jurisdictions that don't have local fire marshals, we find out about a fire, I, ping one of my guys and say, hey, can you reach out to the fire chief and help them to fill out this form so we get the information. It's not about stepping on toes. It's not about invading territory. It's about trying to fix our biggest problem of fire fatalities in the short term and figure out where we have the problem. So this is the primary information that we're concerned about. Uh, victim age, victim gender, type of structure, year the structure was built. Is it new stock, the, the lightweight fall down once it's exposed to fire structure, or is it old stalwart construction? Were there smoke alarms present? Did they function? Were there sprinklers? Did the sprinklers function? Other factors, they were under the influence of alcohol, they were wheelchair bound, they were bedridden on home oxygen. What are the pieces there that contributed to it? And of course, you know, what caused it, where it did start, things along those lines. This is what the form looks like. I've got yeah, about 50 copies up here. If you haven't received one, if you want to take one back or looks at and talks at, I'll leave those up here, help yourself to them. Uh, I need to get with Vanessa because I went searching last night, couldn't find it on the website, so we need to uh, make sure that we get it re, re up on the website. But, it's a PDF fillable form. As much information as you can provide us. Yes, there is a space on there for the victim's name. If you have the name, if you give us the name, great. That's not a critical factor for us. Some, you know, like Office of Medical Examiner says, oh, we can't give you that. That's HIPAA. I'm sorry, the medical examiner is involved in treating the patient. It's, you know, so. And as you saw from the one slide I showed of some of the fatality reporting that comes out of Medford, if you go and you put it into the fire incident reporting, guess what? It shows up in that report. So if you can put it into your Enfridge report, not a re no real reason not to put it into this report. If you have it, great. But again, what their name is doesn't really affect the data that we'll be mostly concerned about. Um, down on the bottom, we have a generic state fire marshal at pdfp.virginia.gov. Once you complete the form, you can just email to us at that email address. It gets to us, we compile them, we look at them, 
we compare that data to the AMPERS data. So, oops. a one-page form, and you know, if, if you can, I'll probably shoot myself for saying this, but you know, along the conversation we had with the state police, hey, our, our incident summary forms due for an update anyway. Once we figure out the data sets, we'll uh, we'll make sure our summary form is includes all of them. And we'll make an SOP if we have a fatal fire, we send you our summary form. Great, so I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get a BSP standard form. Chuck, if you wanna take yours and, you know, here's the Suffolk standard investigation summary form, make sure all that information's on there, great, just, just send it to us so we have the information. If it's not on our form, again, it's more important that we can get that data. With that, just two other pieces, some other resources that are out there for you. Fire Cares is a system that's been set up by UL has been involved in it, NIST has been involved in it, a few others. I'm going to show you some examples from that in a minute. And NFORS, which was developed by the IAFF, the IAFC, and primarily geared towards justifying resources. But both of them are systems that are out there. NFORS is actually, you can use for incident reporting. It will report up into NFORS, uh, but it's a little bit more user-friendly format. FireCares is actually a system where, on the back end, they've gone and pulled NFORS data, census data, insurance data, and you can go in, you can search for a locality or a fire department, and it will give you a community risk assessment risk summary. Um, this is what's publicly accessible. If you are actually that fire department, you can contact them, you can review the information, you can contact them and say, hey, you've got some things that are, you know, need updated, they will update them. You can actually get access to the system so that you can see real-time stuff for, for your system. So Arlington, you know, fire risk high based on the number of structure fires and compared to places around all the fires that occur up there in Northern Virginia, the, the metro bubble. Low risk for fire spread because most of the stuff's concrete high rises. Uh, death and injury risk, medium. And again, it's based on the data that they pulled out of Edinburgh. Combination department, marginally so. Uh, the NFK region is the south, FPID number, protected population 207,028. 0.06 square miles. That's before you take out the Pentagon or Arlington Cemetery at Reagan Airport. For comparison, Chesterfield. Medium fire risk, low fire spread risk, high death and injury risk. 316,436 square miles. You know, so again, it's it's a relative ranking based on the data that's out there in comparison to your neighbors, the state, what have you. And last but not least, couldn't leave, leave you out too, Davis. Charlottesville, hey, look at that, low, low, low. Uh, 43,000, 10 square miles. The other piece, which this is what it shows for Chesterfield, or I'm sorry, for Charlottesville, the annual number of structure fires based on Enver's data contact information, and if you actually go down the bottom of the page, it lists address for each fire station within the department. Um, you know, to get to this information is free. You go to that fire cares website, search for a name, select them, get the, get the information. Again, N4 is the National Fire Operations Reporting System, primarily spearheaded by IAFF to justify staffing. So it puts a little bit different perspective from the data entry, what have you, but it is a system that's available. Uh, it is compatible with NFERS, so if you do your data entry on this one, and again, this, you know, this one's not free. You do have to buy into it, pay a software setup fee, what have you but it is just something out there and it, it, because it was developed by fire service entities, some of the data reporting and analysis tools 
are geared for some of those things like justifying your budget. I need, I need two additional engine companies. I need 10 more people, what have you. With that, questions? Comments? Who wants to be the first to sign up for the six day fire programs? The <laughs> first program. Chief Riley, I saw your hand. <laughs> so, and again, we'll recap at the, uh, at the end of the day with the round table. Chief Dave can talk to the uh, NFBA progress on their system. <coughs> you know, N4's got USFA grant money to do some of their stuff. Uh, you know, there, there's different people out there. The National Association of State Fire Marshals has been looking at the data issue. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a large issue that needs some solution. Last but not least, as I mentioned that, I'm going to throw in a shameless plug. Uh, we're at a conference in July of this year. I want to say it's the 21st to the 25th of July in Annapolis, Maryland. Waterside, July, crabs. Uh, the National Association of State Fire Marshals, we have an annual conference every year. Last year we were in Park City, Utah. The year before that we were in Charleston, South Carolina. This year we're going to be in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, it's co-hosted by Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, so it's the Delmarva host conference. But there are some good speaker sessions. There's an exhibit hall that's set up on Tuesday. Uh, Firemarshals.org is the website. And you can go on there and get information on it. One of the things all my list to do is to push out a blast on local fire officials in my email list of just information and a link to that. So thank you very much for your time and let's see what we can do to fix the problem. Thank you, Chief. So uh, I know that whenever we start talking about data, everybody gets a little bit glazed over and I think uh, uh, our State Fire Marshal's office and every one of you in this room have all had some experience with data. So I'm going to lean on you here for a minute uh, and just talk about your department. And in your department, you see, you see these numbers that come up here. You see how they are handled at the state level. You see how they're handled at the national level. And some of our codes and some of our policies and a lot of the money that comes from the federal and state uh, uh, funding is tied to this information. Um, most of you probably came up through the ranks in the suppression side and ended up in fire prevention in some form or fashion. Um, but I look at you guys, and myself included, and I've got an assistant fire marshal here from Charlottesville with me, and I lean on these guys a lot to make sure that these reports are important. So here's a little bit of a personal piece of this. Uh, Charlottesville had a line of duty death, cancer uh, death, last year. And I don't think I'm out of place that was, we, you guys probably heard about it if you didn't. Uh, his name is Dennis Friend. And one of the things that we had to come up with out of that to get that, and for, for that to be shown, was how many calls did he run in his time with the Charlottesville Fire Department? How many fires was he involved in? And what type of exposures did he have? So I'm going to ask you, if you're back in your department and you've got line officers, suppression officers that are saying, hey, we got back and we coded that thing as 100, fire other, because we want to check those boxes. What is that doing to your department? What's that doing for you? What's that doing for the members of your department that if, if there is a line of duty death, and we all know about cancer, we all know how cancer affects firefighters, this information right here should hit you at home. So you should be thinking about how this information is getting handled in your department, how you're reporting it out, where is it going, what boxes are being checked. So as fire officials and fire investigators in your own department, Q&A, quality control, of what's being reported, what boxes are being checked, or more importantly, what boxes are not being checked, Someone in your department, and this is where I'm looking at you guys, to say, hey, Chief, we aren't filling this out right. If we don't have a policy or procedure on how to do this, we need one. And we need to enforce it. We need to make sure that this stuff gets out because grant money, funding, training, equipment, and a lot of duty deaths are tied to this right here. All right? Thank you. Take a break. We'll be back at 11. Chief Riley, I think you had something. Yep. Chief Riley, I think you had something. Yeah, Chief. I just want to mention, our, our brothers in blue, when you ask them what the most important tool they have in law enforcement, their answer is going to be the pen. You ever look at a police report? 
very, very detailed, very detailed oriented. And, you know, in the court of law, what's the judge say? If it isn't written down, it didn't happen. And so this, this, this direct line, not a dotted line, direct line to fire-related cancers that our firefighters are experiencing throughout the Commonwealth, it's upon us to make sure that documentation, documentation is done in order for us to win the battle at the end of the day when the families are looking for benefits. So I counted 13 firefighters that died last year in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We're honoring seven. So what's the difference in those numbers? The difference in those numbers is that we can't document and prove that they were a line of duty death. And that's our fault. So we all have a, an interest in making sure that that's corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Take a break.